Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we're here with Dario Nardi and we're gonna discuss the four subtypes of the ENFJ personality type. And so we'll be beginning with the dominant subtype. This ENFJ is most densely wired at the front of their brain and Dario calls them the communications director. And so would you like to tell us a little bit about them? Sure, yeah. So this is um, the, the tying with normalizing in my database, the, the most common uh, subtype for ENFJ. Um, sample size and all that. I don't know what that really says, but um, a lot more common than say the creative uh, subtype. And and I think in a lot of ways it fits uh, a certain, uh, like maybe not the stereotype of ENFJ, but uh, the one that people do end up experiencing in the workplace in, in particular. So I, I think where this shines in particular for those of you who might be familiar with uh, personality hackers firm model, so uh, in the firm model, ENFJ is it has a management fixation. And, and so this really, uh, I mean, this is true for all ENFJs, this management fixation, managing others. Uh, but at the same time, this this is the dominant is going to be like showing it the most. Uh, so what, what let, like unpack that communications director. And we talked about a little bit the director part, the communications part, like what's going on in the brain and, and all of that. Um, so one thing I noticed there, there was a strong front bias in terms of brain wiring towards the front of the brain, the executive regions, and then these regions, sort of the, the frontal running from here all the way through here. So I, I like to think of like the executives are like executives, uh, and then the frontal regions, uh, just behind them that we can sort of think of those is like the management level. If this were like the brain were like a, a corporation. Uh, and so there tends to be a lot of density there and then also around the ears. So very, very auditory style and they make really good uh, communicators, that person that's going to be out in public, that's talking, that's an orator, that can inspire. Where some of the details come in with it is, is sort of uh, getting into the functions themselves. Extroverted feeling is the, the lead role. And it's a more yang style is true of, of all the, the dominant subtypes. So this is what I call the shepherd. I think this is really important to highlight. I feel like extroverted feeling is one of those functions that gets stereotyped as like, oh, it's like empathic and touchy feely and this and that. And I think to remember that like, yeah, it's a form of consciousness and it's a cognitive process. So it's like a values based decision making. Uh, and the shepherd is very much about, um, announcing values, uh, speaking to those, uh, like a shepherd would using that metaphor, like going looking for the sheep who've strayed and like bring them back. Um, and at the same time, they also have this uh, sort of analytic yang visionary aspect as well. So they have like, they wake up with this idea like, oh, we're gonna do it this way. And then they go and communicate that. And then in the firm model, which is about management, it's essentially like managing others in order to and they're shepherding them as to towards the vision, which is maybe for themselves, but is often for or with other people, like for the group, the team, um, society, uh, and so on, which is why they often end up in leadership roles. And, and they're just like, I think from very early on, they're going to gravitate into that. Um, and, and then where is the sort of soft underbelly of the type that's going to need to happen when they're by themselves, uh, when they're alone? Or um, one thing that they also have they share in common with ENTJ is this like a little bit of this left executive bias. So like the goal focused executive in us um, that's very much like is on top of things. And although they have those ENFJ soft skills in terms of managing people and details and the way they do that in the system there there can be like an extroverted thinking look and feel to it but again that's just those are just brain skills um that sort of like staying goal focused um screening out distractions um of course making like mistakes and negative feedback could also be considered distractions so the weak underbelly for the dominant is going to be um when that that left executive can no longer hold the dam 
back of negative things. And then, then there's like a huge break that happens. Um, and then the person like completely ENFJ, like completely breaks down and then they need time to recover and all of that. And then they get strong again and go forward with their, their spear and shield. And, and, uh, in the spirit of, um, what is it? Athena or, um, what, what is, what is the Greek goddesses equivalent Athena? And, um, oh gosh, I don't remember. Um, it, it, the owl is is the symbol sort of the owl on their shoulder that's providing that that introverted uh intuition like a wisdom and so on so i would say like those are the like a key points for the dominant and so this enfj most resembles the helen fisher testosterone hormone description and it also is the one that resembles most the eie in socionics too that their version of enfj fits the dominant or the creative subtype the most in in brain wiring mm -hmm. um and i could imagine the youtuber megan lavoda is either a dominant or creative subtype in this system too based on how you describe them and also, Dario, you mentioned something really cool and how ENFJs rarely have creative subtype. And mm. even when they do, it tends to be a weaker starburst rather than a really, really strong starburst. And it's rarer. Yeah, yeah. So so let's let's compare to uh, an adjacent type, actually both adjacent types like INFJ and, and ENFP. ENFPs, regardless of their subtype, invariably... I mean, yeah, there's a few exceptions, uh, individuals, but invariably there's going to be a starburst pattern that's there, whether they're dominant or even normalizing. It may be way down, like on a scale of one to 100, where 100 is strongest and most obvious. And usually something has to be like a score 25 or 50, somewhere in there to actually appear on their chart. For the ENFP, it's going to be still down there with a score of like five or 10, something like that. Like the ENFP can't help but have that that starburst flow process. ENFJ, uh, on the other hand, except for one person, uh, well, I think at the time I finished the book, there was like 28 or 30 ENFJs in the study. And I think four of them, maybe five, had a starburst of some kind and only one was strong. Uh, and to me, it made sense um, why just for like professionally she had to. But generally, for, for the others, like, it doesn't even show up. And and that's, like, for harmonizing, there might be something way down, like an invisible starburst, maybe, possibly. I don't think there even was one, but but let's give that allowance. Uh, it's just very uncommon. And, and so that's a big difference just in terms of those, like, ENFP versus ENFJ. And this sort of makes sense because the ENFP is very much like, in the firm model is is like going with the flow and enjoys the freedom of things and and enfj is much more this uh well i mean they're driven their their dominant function is a judging function rather than a perceiving function that can, can be really like strongly implanted there like a dominant judging function and that shows up then is that function sort of inhibits the the creative starburst pattern unless it's pushed into like their private time or in the rare opera case that their profession really requires it that's fascinating this is a weird question dario do you find the dominant subtype has equal amounts from both gender or is it a little bit gender skewed towards one or the other just because i'm wondering like testosterone is it correlated with gender specific stuff or is it non-gender specific that would be really cool i mean it, so i can answer that um one i, I do have a, a database that's sorted that shows that uh i just don't remember what it was and it probably wasn't that significant uh beyond the like um 17 to 25 age bracket uh, the other thing is looking at Dr. Helen Fisher's work, and she's quite emphatic to say she's talking about relative testosterone level or relative estrogen level. Um, and then that allows, for example, women, yes, they're going to have less testosterone than men, generally speaking. Um, but there are some that among women, just women, some will have more testosterone than others because it's produced by the adrenal glands. And, you know, it's it's not like it just comes from the from one place. Mm. So thank you for entertaining my question. The next ENFJ subtype we'll be talking about is the creative. And 
he calls these the dramatic empath. And so this ENFJ has a starburst pattern in their brain as the forefront pattern. And this type is correlated with dopamine in Helen Fisher's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, one is that I want to emphasize that the, the starburst pattern is almost always a soft pattern that's still like visible, but in the background. And uh, I, I think in only one person and I've had more ENFJs since, you know, like running the data. I still think it's only one ENFJ had this full, strong starburst pattern, 100%. And uh, her profession, I mean, she's a practicing actress. And I know just enough about acting to know that when you do, especially for film and television, the the ability to channel everything and like flow all at once is just absolutely necessary. You You need to be in rapport and have good timing with the other actors that you're interacting with. Um, all of it is acting as if. Um, there is also movement and tracking and the use of props, like where is the camera? How are you moving? How are other actors moving? And all of it needs to come off like very effortlessly and beautifully and, and it needs to seem, and, and in fact, it doesn't need to seem real. It needs to be real just in imaginary circumstances. So there is this, uh, I, I could see like professionally just requires like, yeah, getting a lot of experience being in flow. That said, what distinguishes them from say ENFP or, or other creative subtypes, uh, generally speaking, is that, um, I mean, among the, the intuiting types anyway, uh, is that they still have this like strong um, capacity executives uh, functioning well, so that they know what they're doing and where they're going and why they're there. They still have some, um, you know, capacity to be like, they're, they're socially called the halo and is a socially well-rounded kind of person um, that they still have their stuff together that, that it's not like, oh, completely random. And I don't know what I'm doing and like get themselves into trouble all the time. I mean, for, because of lack of organization, no, that's not going to happen. Um, you also have a little bit interesting quirky thing I've noticed is that there is a region towards the back right, and it, it's this attention to visual patterns and body language and that kind of thing is that the creative is probably, well, if not the most observant in the moment, certainly next to harmonizing, is going to be a lot more observant than, than dominant or normalizing ENFJ. Um, what they do with that is up to them, but there is going to be this element that's there. I also think it's sort of interesting. It's creative ENFJ. And we talk about the dopamine aspect of it is that maybe the extroverted sensing kicked in is, is kicking in a little bit more. And so there is this distractibility and extroverted sensing. I, I want to say brings the person into the moment, but I, I think a lot of it is simply like child, like fun with stuff and the capacity to go with that um, and to be a little bit more a tactical and risk-taking. And, and so those are other things that we see with, uh, with extroverted sensing. And, and while they won't necessarily have, they, they won't necessarily be in touch with the shadow function, extroverted intuiting, they probably, if that's developed, they're working with people who do have that function. And so they have to be more tolerant of it. I mean, I, I know from being in an acting environment um, I mean, just completely as like me as the, the curious participant, um, not, not even amateur, just curious participant. Uh, th there's a lot of NFs, yes, and uh, a, a lot of ENFPs, INFPs, INFJs. And so the ENFJ sort of has to figure out, gee, how do I interact with these, all of these NFPs in the room? Um, uh, but they, they can handle it. And that's... Um, and they will be coming up with a lot of ideas and doing a lot. And so I think that the dopamine element sometimes can show up as like a brainstorming of ideas. But what I see a little bit more here is the, the motor cortex also has a lot of dopamine receptors and is also very active, like moving around, doing things and not just like, not like marching to do them, but like you just have their fingers in a lot of different pies. Yeah, and so the creative subtype has a lot of varied things that they're doing, and they're looking for that stimulation, that dopamine from that. So, mm -hmm. 
but even within that, the ENFJ is very organized. And so you're not going to see them being a, a hot mess, even as the creative subtype. Uh, not, not usually. Um, that said, I, I do suspect, I can't really say from experience too much, but just observing uh, or like close experience, but just observing like different communities I've been in over the years that many ENFJs in their life will have some period where they're like in the, the creative zone in the sense that they're doing a lot of extroverted sensing, introverted intuiting, like that polarity of those two functions. And they're hanging around a lot with SP types and doing a lot of like, oh, you know, we're going to the jungle and we're doing this like shamanic dance for three nights, the moon dance and like this and that. And, and they do have that period, which is more open and exploratory. And, and I think every ENFJ probably goes through that phase or can, provided they have the opportunity. Mm. Yeah, you can have a creative phase, but not be a creative subtype. And yeah, yeah, I, I do think that, that, that we can easily, um, you know, because it is, does reflect development. And e even if something is sort of deeply, even if the subtype is deeply hardwired, which I think is more of a socionics perspective, I, I'm agnostic about it. Uh, I suspect socionics is correct, but I, I will officially be agnostic. Um, that, uh, you know, we, we can visit sort of like as a spiral or certain times in our life, all of the subtypes. Got it. So while your brain scan can have a two year reliability, it's possible that it's just you also going and touching other subtypes while you probably, you might have a main subtype as your home base for your life. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I feel like even over the years, like doing brain imaging on myself, like the majority of the time I've come out creative subtype with the starburst, but not always. Sometimes I have what's called this pillar structure, which is very much like a front to back like executive frontal regions, parietal regions, visual. It's like a very complex lattice work on the left and right sides of the brain. And, and that's, I don't know exactly where to place that. It's somewhere, you know, that, that has some analytical and some holistic skills together. Um, but, but still, I feel like no underneath, I'm always like, I can pop into that space, but I'm always the creative. Got it. So subtype is both nature and nurture. Like a part of it is quite enduring, but part of it is life circumstance can also bring you there too. As yeah. Well. Yeah. And and the, the way I justify that beyond just observation, um, I mean, yeah, there's a few people who've done it, you know, twice over the course of years or something, the brain imaging session, I would say that Helen Fisher's work on neurotransmitters and hormones that until a person say goes through midlife and menopause or the puberty or whatever it is, um, or something big happens like, uh, the, in terms of, uh, you know, hormone balance, um, that, that people's relative hormones amounts, it's physiological and sort of built in genetically. And so that's going to push them to be in a particular direction. At the same time, I believe that in general, and I mean this in general, society and, and within the family unit pushes people to be normalizing, thus the word normalizing. Uh, and then the question is, do we have opportunities? And I think opportunity is part of it too. You know, I think like, oh, like, what would I be like as a dominant subtype? Well, I never really, yeah, I volunteered for some leadership positions and this and that. It never really like swept me away with excitement. It's not some, it's not the kind of person I want to be. But I also have not had a lot of opportunities to do it. Uh, and for some people, it really can be like an impoverishment of opportunity. And they may not actually even get to experience who they're meant to be, like hormonally or genetically. Yeah, so there's almost an epigenetic element to it where you have the genetics, but you also need the opportunity to unlock that specific part of your genetic code. So. Yes, yeah, because when I look back, I see that I had encouragement with creative subtype, and then there was a long period that was really pushing me to be normalizing, but I like I know I'm not normalizing. Um, and then it was just really nice to sort of break out of that, and it's like, okay, no, this is me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I grew up in an environment that was very normalizing and dominant, and I don't have that in my brain structure. So I was like, interesting. I did all the activities that you would associate with that, but my brain just denied. My brain's like, I will not, I will not change my subtype. So I was like, huh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right. And so that segues us to the normalizing subtype.
Mm-hmm. Dario calls this the compassionate expert. And this is the even field pattern in your brain typically. And it is associated with the hormone transmitter serotonin. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, so serotonin is, is one of those hormones that uh, has concern with the, the group or the group's endeavors. So say like an INTP or ISTP will still be concerned about the group's endeavors. Um, it is a normalizing. Uh, ENFJ, there, there's a lot of normalizing ENFJs. They're just as common as the dominant ones. And, um, and, and I want to stress that this is in my database, which is very much people who volunteered and or could pay, uh, which has been most of the time the original student database. Um, so I, I don't know how well that reflects society as a whole, but, but I can say it's a very common relative to what we see with the other types. Uh, so this is one where there's like, there's a very much a farm field pattern. There very much is this, each region is connected to every other region. And, and um, there might be sort of a right hemisphere bias or back bias so that they're, they're not this upfront dominant style. They're very much this meticulous style and wanting to get it right and like getting actually involved with details. So I, with the other types, I've talked about how the third function shows up with the type, because I believe talking about the third function is really important for every type uh, and to, to help people understand it. Um, and if if the extroverted sensing is more like risk-taking and so on for like trying different things, a travel and so on for the the creative subtype, the normalizing, the extroverted sensing shows up in the capacity to handle the relevant details and and to get into um, doing like an activity on a regular basis. It could be like fitness, for example, a healthcare, that kind of thing. Um, the, that, the, the, the sensing is much more directed to something that isn't obviously dopamine driven, but is much more like the group experience or like a stabilizing, I don't want to say stabilizing because it makes it sound like introverted sensing. But, um, I think an example would be, and this is particularly true for ENFJ, um, uh, when we think of the word creative or normalizing creative, we're going to think like, oh, artist, musician, actor, that kind of thing. And, and yes, like the, the actor ENFJ, the actress, she had that strong brainstorming pattern. But I found that actually many ENFJs were involved with the arts in some ways, and most of them are still especially normalizing. So they're the ones that learn music notation, that learn how to play by ear or that or the play by ear. They know eventually incorporating the introverted thinking and like music theory and and uh, I remember sitting, this was like a year and a half ago, uh, I did an Airbnb with a couple in Scotland, and uh, the husband was uh, like a singing teacher and, and musician, ENFJ, I'm pretty sure, I mean, we didn't talk about type, but pretty sure ENFJ. And we did like a little shamanic journey thing, where I, I play and I sing, and he's also playing an instrument, so I did... I don't remember what it was. I think I did the drums and the rattle and he did the cello. Um, And this is somebody who like does music professionally for many years and teaches it and so on. And the way that, that I would play is very different. Like I don't recognize notes or anything like that. Um, And, and what was so interesting, he's like, Oh, I've never actually done improv like this. And I'm like, dude, you are a musician. And, and he's like, I literally have never done an improv sit down like this before. And, and so they are that, that ENFJ that has this like creative inspiration to create a unique song, not just copying somebody else's, but to create something new um, and learning all the ins and outs of it and, and the, the, the domain of it and delivering that with, in a very meticulous way and needing the right environment to do that. Um, and, and wanting to do that in the community. So like he loved singing in a choir and that kind of thing, um, which is nice, but I, you know, I and TJ here, I, I don't feel drawn to that. Um, so there is this element of, of 
fitting in well with what are the established valued ways of doing things. Um, and, and then fitting with the, the behaviors and the learning and so on that goes with it. Uh, I do, I do think overall they may, they may score as an SJ on like the MBTI. Other people will certainly start to experience them as an SJ type unless you really scratch the surface and get to that like introverted intuiting underneath. But then introverted intuiting underneath is the Yinish Oracle style. So you ask them what their vision is and it's, it has to come from somewhere sort of quietly rather than being like the dominance, like we're, we're leading this like political revolution or something. No, this one is, is many, many small things and small voices and the intuition is going to come through um, whatever their muse is, you know, dreams or uh, I, I think that's actually quite common, but you know, there are other through playing music or something, they get some like inspiration that comes through it. And then that will come up as something different. Um, so I, I think that's what distinguishes them from SJs is that uh, there, there is this creative element that eventually comes out and that isn't from the creative starburst, although that might be because I don't monitor them 24 seven, but individual brain regions that sort of like pop up and speak their mind. Um, and that, and with all the NJ types, there is this like certain aristocratic attitude that you're not gonna see necessarily in like a ISFJ or something like that. So it, it's just like a much more step-by-step -step style of doing things. Very cool. And then that brings us to the harmonizing subtype. This is the mystical counselor in Dario's terms. And this most resembles the hormone pattern of estrogen relative to those of this type. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or, or as Helen Fisher says, estrogen or oxytocin, sort of take your pick with them. Um, so this one has both feeling and intuition. I mean, their preferred functions uh, as yin-ish holistic. So the role of extroverted feeling as, as a host rather than a shepherd. So the host, like, how does that work? Um, people come to the house or they come to your restaurant or whatever it is. They come to your office and you're going to host them. And you know that every guest who comes in is different. They have different food preferences. They have different temperature and musical taste. Like there's this, they have different ways of behaving um, and so it's, it's something that we've talked about with some other types. It's, this one is, has among ENFJs, the most capacity for perspective shifting. And so that's where the counselor part comes in is we're going to meet the person at their experience of the world because they're acting in the same way that a host knows, oh, that these people should sit together over there and these people will be better. They'll have a better conversation sitting over here. And, oh, this person is gluten intolerant and this other person is vegan. And like they remember and take all those things seriously and accommodate those rather than um, being like, no, everyone's going to be vegan uh, or whatever, whatever, paleo, whatever it is. What they show in the brain is this, uh, well, one of two things, usually this complex diamond patterns. Sometimes it's going to be maybe just one diamond pattern. And diamond here, for those just tuning into the series, means that there's a network of four, five, six regions that act in concert. So it's like a quartet in, the, in an orchestra, if you want to think of it. And that quartet covers all the bases, the major bases in the brain. So like left and right, front and back. So that it's essentially like a mo an operating mode. It's like a special way of being, I'm going to get in this mode. I'm going to get in this like psychic receiving mode. And I'm going to channel one of the spirits from Atlantis. And I, I mean, I'm a little facetious. They're not all like that. But, uh, you know, to, to, to show that. The other thing that tends to, to be in the pattern for all of the FJ types, but particularly ESFJ and ENFJ is what I call a zigzag. So these are connections which are diagonal connections in the brain that cross the hemispheres. Um, so like here and here are connected or uh, like here and here are connected, whatever. They're, they're uncommon and they're not just like straight like farm field at all. Zigzag implies the opposite of a farm field. Um, and this shows up as unusual ways of 
the brain working, connecting things in unusual ways. So for an example, let's say, so the T4 sensor, this like right auditory region, um, I'm through, through hearing the voice tone, I'm now starting over here in my working memory visualization area to have an image of the person in some other part of their life than now. So they, they sit down with the person. And let, let's just say, for example, it's, it's a counselor again. They sit down and as they listen to the person, they begin to, to have flashes or images of a story that's told about the person, of how they are in the parts of their life, maybe that aren't even directly related to what they're talking about, but it's important information. And this is how that ENFJ can be like, oh, see that couple over there? Like, they look happy now, but actually, like, that's, and, and it does, and then the ENFJ is like, oh, I don't know if I should say anything or even can trust that, because these diagonal connections, these zigzags, aren't common. They're, they're uncommon ways of connecting, almost by definition. I mean, horizontal is, the, or, yeah, vertical rather than horizontal uh let me get that straight. Rather than being horizontal or vertical connections, they're diagonal connections that cross the hemispheres. And so that, that looks really interesting. Uh, it shows up and it comes out as interesting, unusual ways of thinking. And I would say that the harmonizing ENFJ is the most likely to have those, although FJs in general tend to show those. Um, and it can also come out as very dramatic ways because you're connecting things that wouldn't normally go together. And that just immediately strikes people as something interesting or dramatic as opposed to the normal, like, oh, yes, we're going in sort of this regimented expected way. And that's, I, I think, where some of the Oracle mode comes in. And I did have one ENFJ. Gosh, this is probably like 10 years ago now because I, I had the there's like three generations of brain imaging devices, and this was still the first generation, um, is that, that her profession was basically like psychic, was her, her, you know, she was a professional psychic. And that was so cool because she absolutely had this like back of the brain connections. And yes, there, there's like this diamond pattern. And she had a psychic mode that brings together these different elements of, so this is where the mystical part of mystical counselor comes in. Um, and they're the ones that are most likely to, to be lacking the usual stereotypical, uh, this is how I get along in society set of skills. Interesting. And I'm guessing that this subtype is also one that's the one that most looks like INFJ in terms of brain patterns. Oh yeah, like right away the person may even, I I, I mean, it would be very understandable if they were to uh, be typed as INFJ for a long time. Um, and then the question is what sets them apart? Um, I would say the practical approach to it is have them read the other INFJ subtypes and they're gonna be like, no. And then you have them read the other ENFJ subtypes and they're like, yeah, I can be these at other times. Like I understand how those are. Um, and so that's the, because everybody does flex throughout the course of their day to some extent. Really, the subtype is about your home base uh, and where you, you do like your best work and you actualize the best, where you're most like chill and comfortable, uh, where it feels like there's the most reward. Um, and and. So yeah, they, they could easily come off as INFJ. But again, um, I think it's, you want to look at the whole pattern of their life and see where they stretch to. Mm, yeah. yeah, wise words. This is the subtype that Denzel Mensa relates to. And he's, he's an ENFJ with a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. so, very cool. And so Dario, I'm wondering what traits do all ENFJ share regardless of their subtype? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I, I love that we're doing this at the end because, uh, you know, we can break the types down and very sort of strictly formally definitionally in terms of function stack or the preference pairs or whatever it is. Um, but the themes are sort of like the organic expression of the type. And, and those like, when you see a movie, like what are the themes of this movie, uh, uniquely so. So I think that some things that show up, um, one, one is that um, years ago, I think this was like the year after the iPhone came out, 
uh, I, I developed with a friend of mine this um, personality types app. I don't know. If, I mean, today there's like a zillion, and that's a modest number uh, of apps in the app store. But yeah, there, there's one just called personality types. Um, and, and we had to pick an icon. So we designed an icon for each one. And for ENFJ, it, it's, it's shaped in a way that either it looks like a grouping of four hearts. So that's one way to view, you know, like those images where you view it one way or the other way and you see something different. So either you view it in, in one way as four hearts, one sort of one, two, three, four, or you could actually see it as two, um, I would say they're like uh, two birds that are face to face, like two swans face to face with each other. And, and so I feel like that captures a lot of the, the element of ENFJ. Um, one is that this sort of this, this ENFJ has this focus on tasks for the group. So being group oriented and task oriented. And that, by, by the way, may come as a surprise to people. Yes, the ENFJs tend to be very task oriented, like they have creative projects and they want to bring people together or work together or manage people to actualize that project. Um, and, and so that's where the four hearts come in. Uh, and then there, there is the two swans, which is that element of relationships, like the romantic relationship and, and really any kind. But I, I think the romantic relationship with extroverted feeling and extroverted sensing together, like that's particularly appealing. And then we could also think of it as like, oh, the fact that there are two different ways to view it. And, and that they've sort of formed this particular structure like that. There's that hidden introverted thinking that's there um, that sort of is saying like, yeah, there's, how can we understand something in two different ways or how can we define this? And, and I think that that's a nice, just the, the whole notion of like a, a matrix, like a two by two matrix in a way that that's, th th there's that element of introverted thinking that's there. Um, but yeah, to talk about a little bit more organically, I, I think there's this love of communicating and sharing values I see them as very, one of the types that's most aligned with the concept of like a relationship or, or social karma. So that like what comes around goes around kind of thing. And as part of that, it, it's interesting because, you know, there, there is this idea of polarities and there's always this back and forth. And so on the one hand, with that dominant extroverted feeling, there's this values driven, like how do we organize the world and make decisions and get things done? It's through values. Um, and then there's the introverted thinking, which is there in the background, often undeveloped, but working in certain ways. It's a little bit like schemey and, and looking for like the leverage and like, well, I did this for you. So what are you going to do for me? And then that fits in with that like social karma aspect of it. Um, obviously rubs people with introverted feeling the wrong way. Um, and because it's a, and it's the same, I would say the same for ESFJ, the ESFJ is using this dominant extroverted feeling and people with FI are like, no, we, we don't, we're not, our relationship isn't based on a chit system. Um, but I do think that it's there be, because of that. It's like the, this F E T I axis there. Um, I think that they're looking, they, they do like the idea of a win, win or win, win, win solution. Uh, and, and like, how can we set goals and, and find shared success? And they're very much, um, striving for their dreams. Uh, and at the same time, the dream might be something conventional, but I think a lot of times the dream is something that's like just adjacent to conventional. And so they go chasing that rainbow. And then they're sort of surprised, like, oh, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow wasn't what I expected. Uh, and, and I would say that is a feature of a particularly dominant ENFJ, but all of them that there is, um, and especially when less mature, that there's this really strong with the dominant judging function idea of expectation. That in the, the introverted intuiting is also setting like, this is how, this is what it's going to look like. And this is how it's going to be. And now I'm going to like make this happen by managing people and myself to, to get there. Um, but then when you make it something unconventional, that's like really, it's not like an ESTJ deciding that they're going to open a carpet company. 
you know, where like, that's an established thing and, and you go to business school and you just like learn the ins and outs of it and you execute it. Uh, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't look like that. Um, and, and I do feel that they often, especially I, I think for ENFJs in their twenties and thirties, the, a question that bothers them in the background is like, what is my life purpose or life mission or something like that? How can my life is true for all of the NFs to some extent, like how will it be meaningful? Um, and then figuring out how to make that happen. Um, and uh, I do think that the one thing that comes as a surprise to others is that actually it's a type that can get extremely precise and technical. And Jung talked about this, not ENFJs, but with extroverted feeling types, a dominant extroverted feeling type, so ESFJ as well, that um, he said that they usually have one area that they're in where actually they can be incredibly coldly rational and detailed and precise. Um, that's their inner ISTP, but just in one area of their life. And they can really take people by surprise. Um, and they could, I mean, one hopes that's part of their profession, I suppose, not necessarily, but this is how I could say with the normalizing, for example, like, oh, that normalizing ENFJ, how can they be so like technical and precise about their music? Like, where is that coming from? Because that's the, the polarity that's there. And it is what Jung said is that every dominant function has a little bit of a counterpoint to it. And just like for us, you and I, as dominant introverted intuiting types, there is a part of us which is, it's the expression of the intuitive experience through sensual pleasures. And just like the, the bohemian life. And, and it's, it's something that just sort of like can float there in the background, whether we realize it or we're allow it to come out or not. Like that's something that, that is, is a part of it, that it wants to experience that and that balances out the, the intuition. Um, and then, you know, every type has its hardest piece to deal with. Um, I don't know if we've talked about it with every type. Um, some of them are stereotypical. Like we all know, oh, INTPs and like dealing with the physical world and like logistical stuff and so on. For ENFJ, it's living in the present moment. And what I mean specifically is this, is like, is like being physically present in their environment in a way that they're actually attentive to and navigating it. So an ENFJ that I know the best in my life, constantly running into things, not because they're an ENFP, like da, 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 but because their mind goes somewhere else so easily. There's the future plans and there's the past problems and like, how do we reconcile those? And, and I'm like, just enjoy the taste of your food. Like that, that would be the true extroverted sensing in the moment. But it's very, very difficult for them to arrive at that, the core. And I think that's true of all of the types, you know, INTJs, for all the capacity we have to do introverted feeling as our third function, listening is such a challenge. Like active listening, like the, ENF, the INFP does, like just a tremendous challenge. Um, and so I think that there's a core to each function that's the third function. It's just really difficult for the person to get to. And for ENFJ, that's like just experiencing what is without any expectation or judgment or the mind going somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. There's that future pacing or look into the future and mind going somewhere else. Yeah, 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 a lot of it, and and when when you would think, you know, well, maybe sometimes we can be an autopilot. All of us have this experience of driving to a very familiar place, and our mind goes somewhere else. But imagine that, like all the time through your day, in the background, introverted intuiting is coming up to wonderful term you used, future pacing. Yes, mm -hmm. that, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, I, I think actually ENFJ and ENTJ do future pacing more than INTJ and INFJ do. Wow. It is a support role. It is like all the time it's this busy servant. Oh, I'm supposed to be future pacing. Oh, I'm supposed to be future pacing. The hero gets fun downtime. It's the servant that usually doesn't get downtime. And so our hero knows when to like chill out and, and just enjoy things or actually, I mean, I think what happens with INFJ, I was talking to a, 
old, much older in her 70s, INFJ. And, and her experience when she realized she couldn't actually foresee the future. Much less like force it to happen. Like, the, no, that's just not how life works. I mean, you can do things in your life to organize it in a way practically and energetically to help encourage it to happen. But this idea of like, yes, I am seeing the future. She's like, that is not as easy to predict as we might think. And that's, that's you know, that's like the tempered hero who knows their limits. But the poor servant is in the auxiliary role is like tasked to do all these things all the time, which is, is a little bit for INTJ, like the to-do list is never ending. And and the the servant extroverted thinking can never finish enough of the to do list. There's never enough time. For I'm just sort of guessing for INFJ, but it's like there's always something more to manage in one of my many relationships. Which you know, it's just like yeah, and then it's the servant's role to always be taking care of all of the relationships, all of the house guests, all of the time. Hmm. I've never heard that before, actually. So thank you for eliminating that. And I, I, it just came out right now, to be honest. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah. I find that ENFJs can also spread themselves very thin with their relationships or their duties. And mm -hmm. ENFJs struggle with boundaries a lot of the times. And I have some ENFJ friends who can relate to being an introvert because they are so used to spreading themselves thin that they resent it a lot. And then they're like, I'll never let that happen again. And then they do it all over again. Oprah Winfrey thinks she's an introvert and, and it's flabbergasting because she's an, like she's an extrovert in any single, every single typology system, she's an extrovert. Yeah. And it, it's because of this ENFJ phenomenon. If you give yourself and exhaust yourself so much, you, you build a resentment and then, but you still do it all over again because you're, because of that, um, because of that parent function that goes unwieldy, it's like, oh, if I just, and also the hero function that's like, oh, in the future, I can just help all these people. And then, oh, no, I can't. No, no. My energy mm -hmm. runs first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and uh, absolutely. And then combined with this, this dominant judging that wants to have like a, have things set. And, and especially as an EJ type, like to have them set. And the challenge with extra, well, both the strength and the challenge the strength of extroverted feeling is it can recruit and bring other people very easily into the process. Um, the, the downside, as you said, with boundaries and with other people's energy, and it's not just other people's energy affecting the ENFJ or ESFJ. Um, it's the ENFJ affecting other people's energy. And so I think is something really secret about ENFJs is that they radiate an invisible aura energetically, I think especially the dominant that seeks to override other people's thinking and values with their own as part of like corralling and shepherding people. And needless to say, all of the IT types, introverts with thinking are like, oh no, you're not doing that to me. And so that's where that boundaries issue comes in. And of course, like ENFP, for example, as well, extrovert, yes, and enjoys interacting with people. But there's a very strong sense that I'm me and you're you. And that, well, they send out energy to encourage and, and energize and make it fun and entertaining and so on. There isn't this, you don't get this feeling from ENFP that they're trying to override you in terms of your values and your mission and so on in life. They're more just like, oh, does it match? Like, is it interesting? Uh, are we sort of going the same place together or not? Which I think is that that's where the boundaries part comes in. But then when it is like, when the note like really, or the ENFJ's mission really hits the, to use a surfing metaphor, like the wave in the right place, then that can be like super, super effective in a way that other types are like, how, how do you do that? Absolutely. And so what subtype do you hypothesize Oprah Winfrey to be? If you if you believe she's an ENFJ. Um, I, I mean, she's certainly an ENF. I it's funny because the 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 former headquarters of OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network, were just down the street, like literally within five minutes walking distance of where I live for six years or so in, in West Hollywood. Um and uh but but I don't watch Oprah Winfrey and I, I don't know her that well. Um yeah, you know, if if she is, 
You know, this is a really good question. So she's not a normalizing ENFJ. I, I think we can say, and this is a fun exercise sort of to do. She wouldn't be a normalizing. Um, I, I don't see her as the, the, the harmonizing ENFJ when they show up publicly is the, the ancient spirits, like Akashic Records channeler on YouTube. Like when they show up publicly, like that's, that's there are other ones that are not quite like that, but then that that's not, you know, what they do. Um, and Oprah Winfrey isn't like that either. I think she must have a strong element of creative because she gets a whole bunch of different people and does sort of need to shift to these other people's perspectives. Um, and, and some of it could also be the, the content of the values themselves is important. And, and I think that there is a very important difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule. And the golden rule, which can get anyone of any type into trouble, is treat others how I would want to be treated, which doesn't actually work with most people. Um, you really have to shift to how do other people want to be treated and then do your best for that, provided that's in your interest to do that. I mean, unfortunately, the platinum rule does require more responsibility and effort from the person. And sometimes I, I think our responsibility is simply deliver what our gifts can give and be like, yes, I could perspective shift, but that's like way too much work um, for me to do. But she does that and that's her profession. So I would say probably Oprah is such a great communicator and probably and the person who's built like just objectively speaking, she's a leader. She's a cultural leader. She's a business leader, uh, all of those things. So my default answer would be dominant probably with secondary creative. She's very good at speaking to the, the norm of the population, which would also then be able to shift a little bit into that normative space. And then the kind of things that you don't get from Oprah are the kinds of things, I mean, at least publicly, or the stuff that falls into the harmonizing space. And yet she's also very diplomatic with people and that's where harmonizing shows up for her. So I think it could be an example where yes, um, you know, publicly she has like, she has a business persona and she pushes that and, and in her life, I mean, she does that. And then she has like an onstage persona. I mean, I can get on stage and people think, oh, he's an ENTP. I'm not an ENTP. Um, and, and so that we can see the facets and, and that's really wonderful when we can look at a person in their life and see, uh, different facets of them. Um, but otherwise I, I just want to say that I am very skeptical of typing celebrities. I mean, someone, for example, said recently to me, uh, oh, Adam Sandler, by the way, Adam Sandler is who normally is like a complete jokester and, and makes like really goofy movies. He does, as somebody pointed out every 10 years, he makes a serious movie and demonstrates he is an actual actor. Um, and, and then referred to him as an ESTP. And I'm like, I've, no, I've encountered Adam Sandler. He's not an ESTP. Um, so the, many times it's like the, the vision that we get of somebody is not like the person that we're going to encounter. I mean, sometimes it is, but sometimes it, it's not um, because there's a public persona. So that's tough to say. Anyways, long, long shaggy, shaggy dog story there. Yeah. So when you're typing someone online, you could be encountering their public persona. So you could inaccurately see their personality. And so you kind of need to also know them in person and for a long extended period of time to be fully confident of what type they are or or even just meeting them in real life without their I, persona. I, I do have a tip for people who are sometimes confused in typing somebody even live in person. And that's to, and it's all, it's actually an extroverted feeling. It's an FETI approach. It's to just simply look at who do they get along with and how. So for people who might wonder like, oh, some people say like, oh, Dario was an INFJ. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I work with FJs professionally and I, I have some FJ family members, but almost all of my friends are FP types. And I just get along so easily with them. And for me, extroverted feeling is my seventh function is like such a bridge that's so far that, that it's like, look interpersonally where the easy relationships are. And, and not, not just not the, the meaningful relationships, but also the, the easy relationships. Because there are some types like ENFJ is pretty good at interacting with people of all different kinds of types. 
but yet we want to ask like where where do they run into difficulties interpersonally like where are those function conflicts and that that answers a lot of questions or the person can interact effectively but only for a very short period of time and then they burn out um and and i think that interpersonal way of looking at the person's web of relationships which we usually can't know from a video as well mm -hmm. as paying attention to the subtype and the development and and the cultural background and so i mean if i went when i go to japan like every person almost seems like an introvert that doesn't mean that they're all introverts mm -hmm. um so I, I think that's you know the superpower of type is not it's about development yes but it's also not about behavioral traits Mm. And and we need to shift when we even going to Europe, like Europeans, Southern Europeans, even Northern Europeans have different behavioral traits that express their type. Behavior is just an expression of the person's conscious processes and unconscious. Exactly. Yeah. It's not about behavior. It's about consciousness mm -hmm. type. All right. Thank you, Dario, for coming out. Check out Radiance House for more information on Dario's excellent products. And I'll see you all in the next episode. Take care. Thank you.